Hello, everyone. <laughs> it's Friday, and we've scheduled a, ch a chat with Mike Stalium7, aka Stalium7. <laughs> Uh, he is not right now located in Spain, but he is an American. Hi, Mike. Hello. Uh, to start Hello. our talk, I would like uh, you know some general background of your YouTube life, uh, so people uh, maybe somebody haven't seen you, and uh, so they will know better who you are. What are you doing right now? And uh, that would be fine to start the conversation today. Okay, um, Mike, as you said, I uh, I started a channel about two years ago, and um, well, I'm, I'm staring at myself, and it's very distracting. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I. I I got into uh, alternative uh, perspectives when it comes to geology and um, was looking into a lot of different uh, channels that were presenting information that was uh, contrary to what I grew up believing about, um, about geology. And I thought it was fascinating and, and started to look into it more and um, it dovetailed with uh, a lot of other subjects that I was studying, um, looking into earth shape, among other things, and uh, uh, just looking at a lot of different mainstream narratives that we've been taught and asking, is it real? Are, 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 they, are they accurate? And um, the more I dug, the more I found that a lot of things that we're taking for granted that are supposed to be settled science if you go back and you look into them they're not always so settled and in fact oftentimes uh kind of like today you know and what's going on in the world now we find that um the there are lots of experts that are actually saying things that are that are completely contrary to the the mainstream narrative so yeah so you you're showing my channel there i um i started uh, looking into a mountain that that's here in town. You started it uh, two years ago, it says, right? Uh, yeah, it's about that. Two years ago. Yeah. And um, I there was about four or five channels that I was looking at information from, and um, one of them was uh, Mud Fossil University. Roger Spur and his ideas about mud fossilization and the idea that fossilization doesn't take millions of years and given the right conditions, it can happen rather quickly. And um, that was a new idea to me. I hadn't heard that. And then he started uh, talking a lot about how much of what we saw that we think of as um, as biology, I mean, as, as geology is actually biology. And uh, having, I, I, I'm a chiropractor by trade and I studied a lot of anatomy and histology, which is the study of tissues in school. And um, when I when I was watching these videos by Roger, and there was another channel um, that, I, that I'll mention as well, um, Flat Earth Nation, uh, a guy named Alan, who uh, he's been around as long as, as Roger, and Roger gets all the credit for the mud fossil theory, but um, Alan's been there since the beginning and he also, uh, he, he, he does a lot of good research <laughs> and, um, he, he calls it nephorensics, which is the, the study of the remains of the Nephilim. And both of, both of these gentlemen are, um, Christians and they, you know, they say that openly on their channels and they are, um, you know, oftentimes reference the Bible and, and I wasn't coming at it from any of those perspectives. But as I looked into more uh, research of this alternative way of looking at, at geology, the more compelling it became. I saw a video by Wakey Wakey called uh, uh, Geology Revived. And that was that was really fascinating because he was going through a lot of the UNESCO sites and looking at a lot of different buildings and 
I, I just started to think there's, there's way more going on here than, than we've been led to believe. And this, I had been a big fan of Grant Hancock and, and read a number of books by him and all looking at their different cosmological theories about, about comet strikes and major catastrophes and destruction. Him and Randall Carlson, I saw a number of interviews with them. And so I was already looking at all the different ways in which the, the mainstream story didn't really gel with a lot of the findings that were out there. And so I was already a little bit suspicious. Um, but then when I came across these other ideas, it was like, mm, okay. And then um, the thing is the, the town that I live in here in Spain, there's a mountain that is known, it's, the name is Montgo, but it's known as the elephant because it looks a lot like an elephant. And it has a, a big cave that's shaped exactly like an eye. That's exactly where an eye should be if it were really an elephant. And I'd lived here for several years and never considered for a moment that it might actually have been the remains of a, of a Titan elephant. But uh, the more I watched Roger and him analyzing these smaller stones, and it seemed fairly credible because he had DNA analyses and he was a little bit kind of crazy professor vibe, you know, tapping at the screen with a pen. And, um, but it, he was entertaining and he had a lot of interesting things to say. And because of my anatomy and my, my histology uh, classes, I, I was able to recognize that, well, yeah, there's a, an astonishing number of coincidences between what he's showing and what's actually, you know, he's showing in the rocks. And uh, that combined with the, the DNA, it was, it was an interesting, uh, interesting new avenue to pursue. And then he started doing, well, he didn't, I, I started to see videos that he had done on, um, in, in Africa, in, in the Sahara, <clears throat> claiming, are you controlling that? Uh, <laughs> claiming that, um, you know, that there was this 900 mile long dragon. I control everything. <laughs> All those 33 viewers that we, the Masons got. Have we got 33 views, viewers? 36 on my screen. We jumped right over that masonry. Speaking of masonry, <laughs> the head, the head of masonry, isn't wasn't he the head of masonry, Prince Philip? Yeah. So, is that you or me? Is that is that one of my videos, or are you doing that? That's your first video, man. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you can see there from the from the side view that uh, this is the other side of the mountain, and people say, well, it looks more like an elephant from that side but not from the other side and and if you if you look at it from above you can see like the the remains of ribs the eye has a, there's about 20 different anatomical correlations with the eye um it, it it sounds utterly absurd but um the the work that roger was doing with all these videos analyzing this this place in in the Sahara and this dragon attacking a fish with, um, you know, cor corresponding to ancient mythologies and the writings of Plato. And I, I thought it was intriguing. And I never really considered that there might be something to this mountain. Uh, but then I started thinking about the eye and thinking about, cause I'd hiked up there a number of times and there's a lot of strange caves and, and structures in this in this eye and i started to think about it and realize that what if those are those are actually anatomical structures and it's not just the you know the remains of of a bit or just the, a mountain and so rather than just give in to pareidolia which is when you see something and you you think it means something but it really doesn't you know whether it's in the clouds or I can see faces in, in, you know, knots of pine or something, but uh, this, this is something I didn't want to, to make the mistake with. So I decided to study a, a lot of anatomy before uh, re revisiting the, the cave and um, got, got up to the cave. And you, you, so by the way, guys, you don't know that Mike is restarting was restarting the anatomy because he was studying it before so it wasn't new for him right 
Yeah, no, it was a review. Like, for example, if you look at the structure of the skull, the eye, the eye socket has seven different bones that meet in different places. And that's pretty uniform across vertebrates. So it's not just humans or elephants. And so these different places where the bones meet, there's also channels where blood vessels and, and nerves can go. And they're very specific. And if you look at vertebrates, they, you know, they, they have this, this composition of... Uh, this is very important, by the way, because if you haven't seen something like this before in your practical studying or practical, you know, practice that you do during your life, you you won't recognize that shape, right? That yeah, is yeah. impossible, impossible to recognize the shape that you haven't even seen in your in your real life practice. Exactly, and and so I think, you know, I've I've talked about cross-disciplinary researchers. I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in biology. I'm not an expert in, in geology. I'm not an expert in any of these things, but I've studied, you know, a little bit of a lot of different things. So you can start to recognize patterns if you have knowledge. And uh, some would say that that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. Like if, I mean, look at that. Tell me that doesn't look like an elephant. <laughs> there, was, there was a video by a guy named Jay Dreamers that was called Petrified Titans. And uh, that was a that was a fascinating uh, video because he started comparing the works of Roger and looking at the mythology and looking at Titans and looking at lots of different mountains around the world. And he showed some of these pictures in his video. Yeah. And, and so you know the you know the conflict you know the conflict with this because some people think that this is just the images of uh, of the animals, not actually the animals, because yeah. you can also create those uh, animal looking, you know sculptures from the rock yeah well i are you showing my first video here because yeah, yeah yeah That's yeah yeah so that was the very first video i ever made and i like that i would never put that in the video now because that's clearly layering of, of strata right and this of course know, of course of course that's what i'm saying of, a lot of those pictures i wouldn't include but i've got way better examples of you know biogeology and then all all of the research that i did myself on the mountain that i that i would show so if you if you see the videos in order, you can see the evolution that 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 uh, that I went through as I studied this, and I found more and more uh, correlations to anatomy. That after a certain point, you have to give up on the idea that this is just random chance, and you have to recognize that there's a pattern there. So, yeah, and um, then uh, moving to the Mongo, actually, you 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 were planning to tell us about uh, how you started the actual video filming and all those evidence lists, what was the, the actual research method that you used during yeah. that first, first I went online. I was just looking on Google Earth because you can, you know, Google Earth, you can, you can fly around, you can tilt it, and you can get in and see things uh, in a different way. So right off the bat, I noticed that when I looked at it from above, that, the, that there, were, there were cutouts. You, you had the head, and then there were cutouts on both sides right where the head would become the neck. The, the eye was perfectly placed. The other side of the mountain where there should be another eye, that whole side of the mountain is collapsed. So if there was an eye there, you can't see it now. Uh, they call that in, in geology a synclinal, which is when, when there's a collapse of, of layers of strata and, and there's, a, there, there's a curve there. But when you look at the mountain, um, you can really, I, mean, I, could, I could show with uh, Google Earth if I share. Sure, I'm, ju I'm just showing this mountain right now. Okay. Yeah, so that, that side there, um, there's, a, there's a cutout right where the neck would be, and, uh, and then the other side is the side with the eye. And you can see there's a runoff there. So it sounds totally absurd, but the more I dug into it, the more I found not only correlations with the eye, but it turned out that there was also an ear and not just an ear in the sense that you can see that that there's a there's a quarter moon curvature right where there would have been an ear attachment but also as i as i dug in well after i went up to the eye i found all of these these correlations between eye anatomy and and the bone structure and there's like a there's a specific uh, place that we have here in our in this uh, the the maxilla that's called the um, the infraorbital foramen infra being below and orbit is the eye so it's below the eye and it's a hole where nerves and blood vessels go 
And, and all vertebrates have this. It's just that in elephants, they, they happen to be placed more uh, closer like that. And so this, this mountain, if it is an elephant, it's, its head is tilted back like that. So that puts it right in front of the eye. And there's a cave going, going through there in my fifth um, unveiling a Titan video in the, in the, in the thumbnail, you can see, you can, you look right through the, this cave. So that first visit up to the eye after studying the anatomy in the books and having a list of things I would expect to find, I was finding these sutures like right where, right where this bone meets this bone, there's a line there. And there was a suture right there going back right in the, in the in the cave as well and i and you can you can see this is, line like, only while studying right you cannot see it just like in the pictures you won't recognize that line and the pattern right well i show in the videos i show the pictures and i show side by side comparisons and you can see how incredibly specific just that one thing is because where the where the two parts of the cave meet yeah. there's actually a little bit of an overlap and and I mean, it, it, it not only does it follow the line, but it jogs up a little bit and then it goes like that. And I show in an, using an elephant skull that there's a, there's a crack right in the skull, right in that exact spot. And that was one of 10 different things that I found. So I, I already was thinking about making a first video at that point. Then I was just like, I got to, I, I have to show this information. And then I started thinking about this collapse in the mountain and how the left side is, is uh, you know, not present. So there's no hope of, of finding an, an eye or an ear on that side. But I figured if the eye is so well preserved on the, on the right side of the mountain, uh, you know, the right side of the head, um, that maybe there was a, an ear canal as well. So I was thinking I'll go looking for a, for a cave and, when I when I started looking online for this, I told the story before when, when we talked last time. But um, there's a there's a canyon that goes up, and I was hoping to find a trail. So I was looking on Google Earth and and found what looked to be a trail. It turned out to be um, just like runoff of rock. So it looked like a trail, but it wasn't. And I I was going to go climbing up there. And when I looked online on uh, Google Maps, I was trying to find the, the name of this canyon. And when I found, when I looked up the name of the canyon online, I found a website that said Cova del Mijdia. Mijdia was the name of the, the canyon. And Cova del Mijdia was the name for, it's a word for cave. So right off the bat, when I was looking for just a way to get there, I found out that there was a cave there that I knew nothing about. And the more I looked into that, um, the, it was it was unbelievable. There was not only was there a cave there, but a whole team of archaeologists had gone in and had uh, excavated this cave. And they it was at the time that they did this work, it was the most thoroughly excavated cave in all of that. That's actually not the ear canal there. That's called a moose gland that elephants have, and it's uh, has to do with hormones. The ears further back. They're like that little spiral, yeah. So, um, so these guys had gone up. Uh, you know, it's it's at 375 meters, and you need harnesses and ropes to get up to it. And they went there and mapped the thing out in 3D. Yeah. So it's just to the left. They mapped it out in 3D, and um, they they filmed, got footage from inside, much better footage than I could have gotten on my own. And I started to analyze the footage in, in great detail. And, and there were a lot of things there that suggested that it might be an ear canal, that the inner organs are still there. You know, you've got the spiral organ, which allows us to hear sound. And then you have the, the, uh, the semicircular canals, which are for balance. And uh, there's this point in the video where this guy is, he's shimmying on his hands and knees around, like in a curved, almost like a corridor going around. And when you look at the sides, it looks exactly like the, the inner structure of the ear. So it was, it was totally mind blowing at that point. And then I started really looking at the, the structure of the mountain with, with closer eyes and a lot of the rocks on the, the plateau, which is where the, the, the ridge line of the, of the head comes down and then it flattens out. Uh, and you saw that at the beginning when it was looking at the mountain from the side 
that whole area up there has very, very interesting rocks. And they're very interesting because they correspond exactly to anatomy. And I can show a bit of that later on. So the right side, the right side, the collapsed side, uh, or the left side that is collapsed has none evidence at all, right? Through all the length, nothing really well, reminds of anything, right? It's it's not nearly as accessible because the drop off from that side is much steeper. And and uh, I've I've been in there and I've looked a lot on Google Earth and I've hiked up a few different trails in that region. And, and I, I have a new discovery that I'm going to be showing in, in another video, but I have some some little teasers for it, but there's a section there where there's a cave that that goes through to another cave, and uh, it's it has some very interesting crystalline structures inside of it. But I haven't I haven't actually found any. There's there's a cave called Cova del Agua, which is the cave of water, but it's not positioned for an ear or an eye. So, you know, whether it's just like a blood vessel or or something like that, I don't know. Roger refers to, um, you know, artesian wells. Art is, you know, artery. <laughs> so the, the idea that maybe the reason we're getting this fresh water that's coming from the deep of the earth and it's coming up through mountains and then cascading down is that that those are those are former blood vessel channels and uh, arteries. Um, the veins have valves in them, so in the petrification process, they're more likely to be filled, but arteries are, are, um, there's a better chance that they'll be on, um, you know, they won't be blocked. Yeah. That's that. That's a video of the, the team of archeologists. So the fourth video I did had to do with, um, the histology of the mountain, which is tissue. And I have found so many different, very specific things. There's, like our bones, the long, the long bones of our body is where blood is produced in our legs, in our arms, in our skull, in our spine. And when, when those break, if you look in, you know, in the center, if it's a bad break, you can see where the bone marrow is produced. And it's, it's a jagged kind of bone that looks like Swiss cheese. And, and then the, the, the long portion, yeah, that, that one there is not, there's a better example. If you go back it up just a little bit and pause it, pause that if you can. So that that's showing the outer portion of, of trabecular bone. You've got iron ore there. You've got these little tiny lines. And if you see them up close, they look just like micro blood vessels, but then you have the larger holes that are entering. And then when you find the really big holes and you look inside, instead of it just being some channel that's been carved out by you know by the flow of water for example what you find is as you look inside it breaks off into smaller and smaller channels so there's a fractal quality to it just like our blood vessels have a fractal quality and our nervous system has a fractal quality everything is going from larger to smaller and smaller and smaller and that's exactly what you're seeing in those rocks and then in addition to the iron ore, which would be the, you know, the, the hemoglobin contains iron. That's what allows us to, to have our, our blood transport. I mean, our uh, air oxygen transport, because the oxygen binds to the hemoglobin when we're breathing. So where you find the red blood, you're, you're more likely to find the, um, the iron ore. But there's also crystalline rocks all over as well. And I, and I hypothesize that those are blood plasma and that the blood is made of long chain fatty acids. So when it's hit with whatever the cataclysm was, then it, then it crystallizes. Okay. Uh, and I like you to t talk about uh, those, uh, heart rocks and your experience with those, because you recently mm, made a couple of videos, including the one that where you attend, uh, you invited, um, son of one specialist cardiologist who who was uh, specializing in uh, heart structure research right yeah can you tell us a little bit about it well the way the way that started was just in general after watching Roger's stuff and starting to look at the mountain differently and just you know questioning phys physical reality in general um, I started looking at rocks totally different you know I hike all the time four or five days a week, I'm out on the trails and that's, that's how I stay in shape and keep myself sane, especially when, you know, 
99.9% of the people around here are wearing masks all the time. It's just, I just want to get away, <laughs> you know? Uh, but that's only the last year I've been, I've been doing that for the last decade, really. Um, so when I went, when I started looking at the rocks, what I found uh, was that, you know, you have all these smooth rocks, like you can see there, that are um, the typical pebble beach rocks or rocks in a river bottom. And those rocks are very, very different from the rocks that you find in the foothills. So as soon as you start to go up the hill, the rocks completely change. But it's not a gradual transition because those rocks were told they're smooth and curved because they're rolling around in river bottoms and they're getting eroded and they're great, you know, abrasion and bumping up against things and, you know, chemical breakdown. And uh, that's not necessarily true <laughs> because, uh, you know, we have, we have certain kinds of stone that you can just see like sedimentary layer stone. When you look at the side of mountains and they've got these lines and there's different kinds of rock, that's, that's one kind of rock. It's very different from these. These are, these are smooth, continuous stones. And if they're, if they're broken at all, that one, the, the one up above, you can see there's a fracture in it and the one there I'm pointing at now, that one's broken off and that's exposed the ventricle. So three of like five of those rocks right there are showing pulmonary artery openings. And so the way I stumbled upon this initially was um, after, you know, watching some of Rogers and Alan's videos, I, um, I, was, I was a little bit frustrated because a lot of times the rocks that were being described and analyzed in the videos, not, not just theirs, but other people's, a lot of times they were just, you know, there were claims being made about the rocks with 100% certainty. And I'm looking at them going, well, it looks like a rock and, and I have, you know, some anatomical knowledge. So I was frustrated and I just kind of put out a, you know, a, a request to the universe to um, send me an undeniable rock, you know, one that was just filled with uh, anatomical correlations. And about three days later, I was walking to river bottom and I found this rock um, and it was it was just amazing because I immediately recognized that the, the chambers were in the rock. You could look in, you could see the chambers. There were, I spotted in the river bottom at least eight or nine different anatomical correlations with that one rock. And then by the time I got home and busted out my anatomy book, which had all kinds of detailed images of, of hearts from cross sections and, you know, different, different parts of the anatomy, um, when I started to go through the book and, you know, with the rock there in my lap, it just totally blew my mind because I found 15 different anatomical correlations. And, and I'm just like, the odds of this happening in a rock are very, very slim. And the, and so I initially sent a, a video to, to Roger um, of just rotating the rock to show the different anatomical features because I figured he would recognize it for what it was. And uh, I was like, you're welcome to use this in a video if you like. I, I had no intention of making a video about the rock. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, he, it didn't interest him at all. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't understand it. I was like, this is better than anything he's shown on his, <laughs> on his channel, in, in my opinion, based on what I knew about anatomy. And he had no interest in it. So I was like, okay, well, I better make a video about it. And uh, I made a video called Mud Fossils, The Heart of the Matter. And I, um, you know, I show the anatomy side by side. I go in with, uh, and uh, what is it? I can't remember the name of the, it's a, it's a camera, uh, endoscopic camera, like they use for colonoscopies and stuff, you know? And so I got in there with the, the camera and show the insides of the, um, of the, you know, I just I just show the the part you you were showing the inside yeah, of the heart. It's, it's absolutely amazing, and to me that one rock is a is a game changer. But what what happened after you know after going through this whole process and making right there the papillary muscles that little bump both openings have that bump, and that's where the muscles are that are pulling the valves open. And that little hole in the back there, that gray, there's two. One, the, the right side is wet because I wet it and the left side not. And both of those have what are known as sinus sinuses, which are little tiny openings between the, the chambers of the heart. 
And uh, that's going in the A order right there. Um, and on the right, if you, if you back it up again, just a second. Um, yeah, we'll wait till it goes forward. But the, the coronary artery, which is a smaller artery that uh, often is the cause of heart attacks, um, that, that goes across the, the upper two thirds portion of the heart and it's in a very specific place. And oftentimes there's fat accumulation right around it. And you can see it there on, on the right side there, the, there's the coronary artery. The coronary sulcus is just above the fat, which is this indentation where the, where the artery lies. So, I mean, these are like so incredibly specific and the people who are just brushing this off as, um, you know, they, they're, they're not really giving the research the time of day. There I'm showing fractures and how as soon as they have a crack in them, that's an indentation there in the big one. I have a theory about that. But uh, these other rocks, you know, there's another indentation. That's bent in. That's not some kind of erosion. Um, so if you notice their harp shape, they look like, uh, as Alan says, bicycle seats. Um, and... Uh, you know that there's so many i could i could talk for hours just about the rocks but uh so basically what happened is i i decided well if there's if there's one <laughs> if i can find one i should be able to find several right if, the, if it's a real thing it, it shouldn't just be this rare one in a one in a trillion occurrence and uh so i went back down in mud fossils the heart of the matter part two i went back down to the river bottom and this is a this is from a video called Broken Hearts Tell Tales, where I start to break them open, and uh, it reveals chambers and blood, and and uh, you know it's pretty it's pretty undeniable when you see it all as a whole. Um, I'm going to release a little short video soon. You can see there. It didn't look like that at all on the outside, did it? <laughs> um, yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy. Crazy holes, and you you won't even understand what it is if without actual knowledge in anatomy and all those hard yeah. research. And, and that reminds me of something I've said a number of times, which is that we're not taught in school. First of all, we're taught in school that this is impossible. It, if it if it were to ever happen, it would be an anomaly that would be a one in a million sort of a thing, uh, because soft tissue doesn't petrify because the the bacteria and the larvae are going to eat away at the tissue long before it, you know, it could ever petrify. And um, that was, you know, where mud fossil theory was fascinating to me because the idea was that when, when the mud comes in and it surrounds the tissue, that it creates an anaerobic environment where the bacteria and the larvae can't thrive. So they're, they're not going to be able to eat away at the, I mean, there are anaerobic bacteria, so that might be a little bit of a hole in the, in the theory. But, um, you know, there, there are, um, you, there, we're, we're taught that that can't happen. Uh, and yeah, and what is your take on actual, you know, po most possible things that could have happened that could have created some, something to fossilize very fast? And yeah, it's two different layer levels of, uh, of inquiry. Um, the first I, I just assumed was mud flood. Um, but that was confusing to me because I could understand it happening for different body parts, but I couldn't understand preserved organs being found separate from the body. Like you would expect it, it to be a mix of those things. Why so would like if something biological is, is, is simultaneously, the whole body is simultaneously covered with the mud and the oxygen excess is uh, you know, canceled, then right. what? Why wouldn't how you many, find the whole body petrified? How, how many years then it, would it take after recovering? Know. Roger claims to have petrified a chicken bone in six months. He said it smelled awful. <laughs> what 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 the officials say actually? What is the uh, possible age to something to fossilize and get petrified? Well, there's a lot of you know new stuff is coming out all the time, and they're finding. I you know I don't have articles to refer to. Uh, off the top of my head, but there are lots of examples of petrified soft tissue. I, I so did is it hundreds of years, that. decades? What what what's the shortest? I would say. Well, I'm leaning more towards instantaneous now. 
I, I don't, I, I think mud fossils is a thing. I think that it, you know, maybe it happens in six months or a year or a couple of years, maybe it happens partially. And then, you know, I, who knows? Um, have you have you seen any anyone perform anything like a testing of that online? Maybe recording there was, that. There was and one channel I can't remember the name of it that took like forty thousand volts and ran it through mud and silt and and put what was it? It was a fish. You put a fish in uh, for like ten or twelve days and just had this arc arcing current going into it, and it uh, it was an interesting. It was like two hours, but in the end it wasn't really conclusive and there were people that were suggesting other compositions for the, the you know the makeup of what was surrounding it um i i don't know i th whatever it was i believe it involved you know huge amounts of heat and, or perhaps electricity and plasma and i think it probably happened very quickly alan who's who's a devout bible believer talks regularly about the glittering sword, which the Bible makes mention of, which is, you know, instantaneous things turning to stone. Got some interesting stuff with what is it? Well, well, it should be repeatable, right? If so many people watch these videos, like uh, he has like a hundred thousand subscribers, right? Yeah. I, I, I'd say like maybe a million people at least watched one of his videos, right? And so, Somebody could have performed something like, you know, piezo electricity test, or I don't know. So many tests could have been performed for 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 at least a couple of years, at least, right? Yeah, there are a lot of people who think mud fossil stuff is is BS, and uh, uh, no, I mean, I mean, there is no repeatable way. Nobody knows the explanation, right? That is the point. No, but you can find the remains. There's some very good examples of petrified brain. Uh, there's Girolamo Sagato, who is a uh, and 18th century Italian scientist who um, he knew how to petrify flesh and the secret died with him. And there's museums that have loads, of, I mean, every single body part, he petrified it inside and out. Um, Was he officially publishing his research? That Italian guy? I don't know. How, I, how, I, did, you, how did you find him? Uh, I think originally J Dreamers made mention of him in, in that Petrified Titans video that I saw. Um, and then I just went looking online websites and saw a couple of videos. Um, but the pictures are there and the museum is there. So, ah, so you, you can go to a museum, right? You can go yeah, to a museum. Yeah, there are museums in Italy oh. to this, or one, at least one, maybe two. Uh, and there was another guy, I think his name was Bruno, that was also known to have been able to do it in, in Italy. So, um, yeah, there, petrification of soft tissue in, in our past was a thing. <laughs> Whether it happened naturally in the environment, that's another, that's another question. Uh, Dave Martin says, uh, this is a different type of cataclysm than the mud flooded cities. Well, for sure it is. We, we don't fight petrified people uh in the basements but we find uh actually each time somebody does excavation in moscow they find bodies mm -hmm. everywhere and so they try to blame communists for those bodies i don't know sometimes they find some such crazy explanations but you know things are getting buried way deep in the ground so it's definitely yeah. not petrified and so it's really different from what mike says but the idea of mud part. covering something it's skeletons under Paris in the catacombs or something like that. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. But the, I think Dave but, means uh, that that is a little bit different and we agree. But also when it comes to like resets, you know, the, the idea of like, there was the mud flood. I don't know people place it at different time periods, the, the last major one. Um, but when you look at the time before that, you know, the, the period of time like Angor Wat and these different, I don't have the names off the top of my head, but there are loads of different places where they've supposedly dug caves straight out of solid rock with Bronze Age tools. Uh, I think that those are perfect examples of some major, major energetic cataclysm where stone melted as well and possibly buildings. You know, there's the whole Elephant Island in the South Pacific, no? I haven't. Hey, Berserker Bear. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we were touching the topic of pareidolia and possible just creating statues from some rocks, maybe, 
you know, big monuments that could be created by whoever, even miners. Yeah, right? Mike Ferrer talks about the miners doing art. And I think like when you see those elephant shapes where you got all the strata or it's sand or it's sandstone, then sure, someone could have stood there with a hose and shaped it out. I have no problem with that. Um, a lot of the, because I've watched two videos that you've done with him, and I think a lot of what he says makes sense. He doesn't agree with anything I say, but um, I, I'm more of a syncretic. Uh, yeah, one, one, one case is, is <laughs> when you have those biological and tissue, uh, you know, uh, coincidences, I would say, at least. Uh, and the other thing, when you just have only shape or the way the rock look looks, this is not, this, this is way different because the list of coincidences you mentioned was around 30 coincidences, right? I think with the heart stones, it's up. I have a list of about 25 different uh, characteristics that, that I've compiled. Um, and it's in, they're in the videos. Uh, those, those are very, very specific. And basically the way I look at it is, you know, finding an oval shaped rock piece of cake, right? <laughs> finding a round rock, easy. Finding a rock that's shaped like a harp or a bicycle seat. Okay, hmm, that should be a little harder. And this is something I started to touch on before. We're taught certain things about stones and because of that, we're blind to possibilities. And what we're not taught about stones is that if, if organs can petrify and some of them can be hearts, then, then that means that some of the rocks have a top and a front and a back and a bottom because they sat in the body in a particular way. So if you, if you understand that all of the different hearts that are out there from species to species are all completely different shaped, they all have similarities. They're all hearts. They all have blood vessel openings in more or less the same place. Some are three chamber, some are four chamber. Technically, none of them are chamber and we can get into that later. <laughs> but you know, the chambers of the hearts, um, when you, uh, when you, I lost my train of thought there. I was thinking, I started thinking about torrent wasp uh, because, of, you know, the myocardioventricular band. Um, yeah, so we're not, we're, we, if you look at how the heart sits in the chest cavity, it's got a slight tilt to it. It's slightly to the left and it has attachments at the top. And that's where the biggest blood vessels come out, the aorta and the vena cava. And then the, the pulmonary arteries go in on the side or slightly in the back. And so, so if you look at the anatomy of it and you start to compare that to rocks, if you start to find a bunch of very specific things in the rocks, is it pareidolia or is it a pattern? And how many of those specific things do you have to recognize and spot before you, you can rule out pareidolia because what you have is a very easily verifiable, repeatable pattern. And that's what I've shown in my videos is that that this particular shape reoccurs way too often, this harp shape. And the reason it occurs is because when the, when the body dies, the heart goes into contraction, right? Rigor mortis, all the, all the muscles contract in the body. And when it does that, there's a, there's a, where's the camera? There's a, there's a spiraling that, that happens with the contraction. So these, these rocks are curving in on the sides and twisting slightly. They have holes at the tops, holes at the sides. Oftentimes they'll have what are called sulcus lines, which is where the, the different parts of the, the, the heart, when it's folded up, they meet in different lines. So you get lines going one way and lines going another way. You can't really see it in that picture. Um, and, and that one there, the, there's a chunky portion at the top that's where the investitures are for the heart going into the chest cavity. So, so a lot of the rocks will be rough on the top. They'll have indentations or holes. And uh, these are very, very specific things, you know, and the more of them you find, the more of them on that list, the, the greater the chance that what you're looking at is, is probably a petrified heart. Um, so uh, the, 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 you have actually used the scientific method. Can we assume it was scientific? Pause that there, go, go back a little bit, because a lot of people that criticize me, they're like, if you go back to that diagram, you know, they're talking about, oh, you're just cherry picking. That's the, that's the term. You you have a belief and you want to find rocks that, that match your belief. So you're going out and you're looking specifically for those. Well, 
there's some truth to that in the sense that I'm I'm trying to spot patterns and and this particular kind of stone reoccurs over and over again. Why is that? Well, other organs like kidneys, like how often have you found a kidney shaped rock, you know, with a little indentation right <laughs> right where it should be, you know, the other way like that. You know, that happens all the time. It's very easy. Uh, a spleen is is shaped like a like a disc. So there's a lot of very boring nondescript rocks that if you started pointing at it and saying it was an organ to somebody, they'd, they'd call you a lunatic. Um, so yeah, if you look at that and make observations, well, I observe things. I ask questions, ask an interesting question, right? Think of, think of questions, formulate a hypothesis. Why does this rock look like this? Well, if I put aside the pre-programmed beliefs about rocks where they tell us that that all of those rocks that you saw in the video earlier when I had them all lined up on the table, all of those rocks are the byproduct of sedimentary layers forming from creatures dying under the seafloor and on the land and getting, getting buried and buried and buried and under pressure for millions of years. And then tectonic activities is, is, is going to break those upward. And then pieces of that are going to break off and roll around and then get, get, you know, go down to the, smoothed out in the river bottoms. And that's not what I find around here at all. What I find is one or the other and nothing in between. So yeah, so develop testable predictions. That's exactly what I did in my second video. I said, well, if this is a phenomenon, if it's really true, I should be able to go out live and find more rocks that match that category. Now, have, I didn't you, have you looked only in one uh, area or you visited several areas? Uh, I Really, in this region, I'd say in 20, 30 kilometers in any direction, because um, when I was doing all, like in the beginning, when I was doing this research, I wasn't, I wasn't traveling much. I was just here checking things out. And then, then we had a year of lockdowns that were, you know. Yeah, I'd suggest you visit some more places to collect more evidence elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this. I, the thing is, I, I know it's not a local phenomenon because people have sent me pictures from all over the world. They've seen my videos and they sent me emails and different things. And they're like, is this one? Is this one? And people in other places are finding much better specimens than I am because they're finding, like, I think that once it's already a rock, if there's another reset, then, then it's going to get bleached out more. It's going to become more like bone white. And, uh, and you know, you're not going to really notice the color. So I think the ones that had like that, that one's that, that one's pink there. And then I'm going to show a, um, yeah. So you can see um, how red it is inside. And uh, that one's even showing a little bit of a, of a chamber. So I, you know, within a, an hour or you know 45 minutes in any direction I, I've gone and, and what you find they, they tell you you know you would expect to find rocks like this in river bottoms uh, because of erosion right and but as, as they, the officials say yeah. I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying this is they saw that correct man <laughs> yeah, but as soon as you start to go up the foothills you don't find that you you might find one out of thousands and thousands of rocks um, but what you find up in the hills in this whole region are fragmented pieces of of uh, larger structure like this you can't tell me that that's going to roll around in a river bottom and start looking like like a harp now here this has got iron ore attached to the back of it if you look at the up close i don't know if it'll focus enough but that's that's an example. You can see the little micro blood vessels there. Maybe you can't if it's not clear enough. Let's see here. Here's a better. Here's a better example, maybe. So it almost looks like elephant skin. That's the fun thing. Yeah. There's a guy. There's a guy in uh, Thailand. Ian. Hold on, I've got his site here. We can we can play a little video from his channel. It's really interesting. Um, he um, he saw my videos and he saw Roger's videos, and he started to realize that he had seen what I call trabecular bone, which is I, I, the fourth 
Titan video, I go into detail about, about bone structure, what, what bones look like inside, what cross sections of bones look like, how I would expect that to manifest in a creature that's three mile, you know, three, three miles long. And uh, he saw my breakdown of that and realized that lots of the places that he was familiar with in Thailand had similar kinds of stone. But as he started to look at it, it was on a much, much bigger scale. So he's, he's basically looking at all of Thailand being one elephant. <laughs> so have you have, have you made a video chat with him or something so uh we text exchanged texts and talked a little bit um but never done any videos or anything he's made videos and his channel name is um here I can I can send you a link. We can watch it if you if it's only three minutes long. But he's got some very interesting. Just uh, send send the link to the chat. To the chat. Where is it? Here we go. Uh, too many tabs open. There we go. Everybody, everybody, you. <clears throat> so he he found he's doing a histological comparison. He's looking at the anatomy in detail, and he's he found just some amazing stone structures. Now Mike would probably Mike Ferrero would probably say it's just slack, but if you look at the histology. No, <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, uh, you also touched the topic of um, ancient myths, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah, about so this petrification that were preceded by different creatures, mythical creatures like Medusa Harkona or whatever you, your name is. Right? What, what, what can you tell about it? Does it have any correlations of immediate petrification and what you see actually on the Mount Go Mountain? Well, there were two reasons I kind of abandoned the mud fossil theory when I was trying to understand what I was finding. People, people think I'm trying to create my own thing or through, you know, Roger under the bus or I'm trying to steal his thunder. I just was trying to understand what the empirical findings that I, that I came across here. Um, it didn't make sense to me that the mountain, which is 750 meters, could have been covered entirely with mud and stay that way long enough for the whole thing to turn to stone. It just didn't make any sense because that would mean that the entire region would have had to be, be covered with at least 800 meters of mud and that all of that mud would have had to have disappeared. Um, now, having said that, there is a star fort at 825 meters that I that I featured in a, in a video um, that's two thirds covered in mud. How did the mud get there when it's at the top of a mountain? Interesting, <laughs> very interesting, you know. Someday I'll, I'll, I, I've got a lot of great footage of, of that star fort, so I want to- um, Yeah, all the rocks could, could, have been, the could have been mud before because, you know, we see this uh, geopolymeric uh, way of uh, petrification, for example, in um, Armenia, where they were, you know, creating defensive, uh, facilities for, 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 for the shooters, uh, creating them, them with the sandbags. And so the sandbags were uh, wetted by the rains and always drying on the, on, the, on the hot sun. And maybe some mud was also in those sandbags. So it kind of dissolved and all those sandbags petrified suddenly in 10 years. There's and right now it's just like, you know, what you have in Peru or something, like a megalithic wall, yeah. man. Yeah, I think those were geopolymers. There's a two-part series by a channel called Observation Deck. I don't remember the titles of the videos, but it was two parts on, on geopolymers, and he went back through old texts. He found recipes. They, they knew how to synthesize any kind of stone, marble, you name it. Uh, I, I saw in a museum in Athens once, they had, they had a vase that was just incredibly delicate that was made out of diorite, which is the, the second hardest material. And to think that they had some diamond cutting instrument 
and a lathe and could possibly have carved this out of solid stone, uh, you know, without breaking this fine lip. And they couldn't even have gotten the instrument inside to carve out the vase. So it was imp it's impossible that it was carved. It had to have been thrown like, like on a potter's wheel. Well, maybe they could throw it on a potter's wheel and then set it just like we're doing now with fillings and teeth. You know, we have these geopolymers, we, we, we have these plastics that go up and, and they're soft until you hit them with ultraviolet light and then boom, they harden, right? So I think that's much, that was a, such a huge uh, couple of videos for me because I started to realize that so many of the megalithic architectural sites were, were not quarried stone that was lifted and moved and placed, but were actually probably poured in place. And I wouldn't be surprised if the pyramids were done that way, Baalbek, these, these incredible sites. It makes a lot more sense. Although at Baalbek, you can see 1,200 ton stones that look like they're in the process of being quarried out. So I don't know about that one, but I, I think geopolymers is definitely a thing. And um, so I abandoned the, the, the mud fossil idea when it came to both the mountain because of the, the requirement for the mud to be so high and stay there for so long, but also with the heart stones, because that didn't make any sense, because why would you find a bunch of organs separate from the bodies? So that was when I started theorizing that maybe maybe the, the outer portion of the body was being destroyed in some way while the organs were, were hardening. And, and that was, I, I mean, just to simplify it, I call it boiled egg theory now. <laughs> Yeah, those are interesting. The trees that grew up through layers of strata, that, you know, doesn't work that way. <laughs> So-called <laughs> petrified trees. And yeah. actually, these are just polystrata. They just grew up, cold. they just grew straight up through the stone, right? Yeah, sometimes we, we have, uh, this is near Greece. This There's is Yellowstone River. And this is uh, this is Hungary. I, I was uh, I want to talk about this one, and I made a video about this. So also found below the level of the surface while creating these excavations in this quarry uh, procedures, and so they found all these petrified stumps. Mm -hmm. so That's the fascinating. Tree. So they've removed that earth then, or or did it disappear? Uh, yes, and so. Uh, it was like they were standing uh, vertical, not horizontal. So, uh, so probably they they call it um, just you know coincidence. While they been excavating this quarry for coal, mm. they were seeking for coal, and that's why. And these are horizontal petrified trees, right? So they're just laying around, right. Mm -hmm. So, and those who were petrified while not being, you know, knocked uh, to the side, very interesting way because they're supposed to be, petri you know, petrified kind of fast, like the way you were talking about uh, in your Mongo video, because huge body of elephant will be probably, you know, dissolving on the sun and, you know, will, you know, just lose yeah. a bunch of uh, different uh, that was why i originally thought it was mud flood theory yeah so it was covered it was covered right after yeah. it's supposed to be you know dead this animal was dead right right yeah that would work maybe for a normal size elephant but an elephant that's the size of a mountain that doesn't make sense to me um and and it doesn't make sense with the the heart stones either so then I, I started thinking about, well... And by the way, what is your explanation about so many hard stones at the same area? Well, I think that, that the world was far more populated with life uh, even as much as 100 years ago. And going back maybe 500, like Dante, whether it was written in, uh, what, what was he? 1400s in Italy, he talks about flocks of birds being so great that they blocked out the light of the sun. So I don't have a problem with the quantity and also the idea that maybe there's multiple resets and that life 
comes back and thrives again, and then there's another reset. Well, the rocks from the last reset are still gonna be rocks after the next reset. So, so then there would be an accumulation. Um, uh, could this yeah, be just the creek where uh, all this mythological uh, situation uh, it's from more, the creek? It's more in the yeah. valleys, the valleys, and then the beginnings of the foothills. But so, what, how do you compare it to the myth? You you said there was only one place in the Greek myth, and they said there was a land of Medusa, right? And she was, you know. No, I was, I was. Um, ah, I, okay, you might have misunderstood what I said in the video. It, it's there have been a lot of different synchronistic events as I've been studying this stuff. And one of the synchronicities happened to be that the, um, the name of the river where I found a lot of these rocks and, and, and the, the river goes through this valley and then it empties out at the sea. That whole, that whole river is called the, the Gata de Gorgos, which, which literally means Gorgon's cat. And the Gorgons were three mythical sisters from Greek mythology that had the snake hair <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there's the there's the myth of Perseus cutting off the head of Medusa and then turning the Titan, the Kraken, to stone. So I just thought, well, that's that's kind of interesting. Here I am doing all these videos and finding all this potential evidence for petrified body parts, and uh, and it just happens that the the name of the river is the Gata de Gorgos. Um, Another thing that happened, that, that rock that's just behind our pictures, that's here in my office, that's, that's about a foot and a half long. And it's got a dozen of the anatomical features that, that, I, that I lay out in, on the list. And, and I was like, well, what was this, a giraffe? Or a, you know, what, what's the biggest land creature we have? How big are their hearts? The heart is about as big as, as your fist, you know? So this is like, how many, <laughs> How many of those do you, you need for a foot and a half? So I'm like, that was a big creature. And uh, and then I was with a friend, Victor, and some other friends, and we went to the Star Fort, which is a, it's a castle that's just on the other side of Mont Go. And as you enter on the right, there's a painting uh, or a, um, a blown up poster of a painting that's in, in the museum inside of the castle. And it's showing all of these different people doing different things all around the castle back in the day when it was like a hustle and hustling bustling you know metropolitan center because it was a roman village according to official history um and so it was a port lots of boats coming and going people getting in and off of the boats and all kinds of activities and if you look close it looks like you've got big people and little people and at first thought you might think that those little people were children but when you look closer, you find they're not children. What you have are giants and our size people. And, you know, we're talking. Yeah, about and we're talking to uh, f this head effect. He was holding the head. And so he was turning the eyes. So whatever the eyes were directed to got Turn petrified. So that's kind of explaining us some if it was alive. certain technology, maybe uh, not eyes, but maybe yeah. some, uh, you know, Ashes perhaps <laughs> maybe some glasses which maybe binoculars binocular type of uh yeah. you know or frequency maybe just, that maybe were if you get into the realm of mythology then then there's all kinds of different myths around the world like the uh, my friend rodrigo has talked about the, the the salish indians and what are known as transformer rocks they have a whole like you know mythology that surrounds these rocks that can also be reanimated and come back to life which i hope Mon what about uh, golems golems also golems turning to stone that's like the tolkien stuff uh we have um obviously the glittering sword from from the bible you've got the book of enoch talking all about titans and a great you know a great great war and battle and, and uh, a bunch of spells like uh witch witchery and witchcraft that yeah. people spell so also frequency all the, all the, frequency. Of the of the element benders you know the earth benders and the water benders like from the last avatar um which are you know that th those are also talking about the same kind of thing so but then, but then if like in my petrified titans and organs part one video, which was called the discoveries, I talked about a bunch of the different questions that I had and things that I couldn't answer. And I was initially leaning towards um, uh, volcanic explanations because once I discovered that, that uh, stone people, 
<laughs> Once I discovered that, um, you know, pyroclastic flows were over a thousand degrees and could move at the speed of sound, or so they claim, then I thought, that might be something that could flash petrify. And in the process of hardening the organs, maybe it's just annihilating the outer portion of the body. Um, and, and then I started to think about the organs. And the interesting thing about the organs is they're, they're in the chest and the abdominal cavities and they're hanging, you know, they're attached so that when you go running, your organs are not moving all around, right? But they're, they're attached, but they're in a liquid inside of the pleura, which is a giant fatty chamber right? That all of the organs are in one big fatty chamber called the pleura. And then each one of the organs is wrapped in fascia, which is a thick fatty layering. And the heart has the thickest of all of the fascia layerings. So when, uh, when I was thinking about that, I, I, I started to think about a boiled egg. You know, you've got a shell and then you have liquid inside. And then in the space of five or six minutes, it's transformed into this hardened thing. And I thought, well, what if the heat was 10, 20 times, 100 times hotter and the time was longer? <laughs> well, as the whole body is being annihilated, those might turn to stone, might. I don't have a way of reproducing that. I suppose if you put an egg into a kiln, you know, like you were gonna bake pottery or something and you just leave it in there for a long time, it'd be interesting to see how hard it gets. Um, you know, and it may involve electricity or, or plasma or something as well. But uh, but then I was like, well, where where are the long bones? Where <laughs> where are the legs? Where are the arms? Where's the scapula? Where's the where's the skull? It didn't make it didn't make sense to me. And then some people in the comment threads were like, well, was it a bunch of cannibals or something? And they just discarded the <laughs> the organs or what? You know? Yeah, they they, like they, they would they would have been eating hearts then because cannibals yeah, that didn't make sense. Hearts. Yeah, they like the, the cannibals like that stuff, don't they? So uh, anyway, so I maybe I, I, maybe they were trying to if 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 we you know, like take take an action and taking you know consideration this you know dismantling of heart taking out the heart that is kind of <laughs> uh, you know uh, kind of what we saw in the movie about uh, uh, Mexican pyramids inks that were you know cutting heads yeah, and inks. taking out hearts. And then what they were doing with those hearts, actually, maybe they were putting them in some, you know, petrification chambers. You know? Right. But I mean, to, to have so many of them that they just fill the beaches and the, the river bottoms. Who, who knows? And they're, they're all kinds of different sizes also. So I, I don't I don't think they were removed. I think what why, happened. Why, why would have been, you know, creating those pyramid structures also, you know, it's unexplainable in official uh, version because, you know, they were saying that this is religious, religious monument, religious, you know, building something uh, considered in uh, the uh, afterlife, right? And so yeah. when we see a bunch of those hearts in some, in the same creek, in the same river, which is you know, not a coincidence, and uh, maybe people were, you know, having this uh, religion to put the hearts in some, you know, under pressure mud or something. I don't know. Who knows? Well, this is this is an open source investigation, as my friend Howard likes to say. It's like I don't have all the answers. I don't have I don't have a big budget. I don't have access to university machines to do, you know. Uh, spectro, spec. I always forget that word. Spec, spectrograph, spectro, spectroscopy, spectroscopy. That's it. You know, spectroscopy or cat. I, I tried to get cat scans done of some of the the hearts because I've had donations on my channel and I was just going to use the money from the donations to do the cat scans. And then when I went to go try and do the cat scans, they said uh, no, only human subjects. And so now my the next thing I. I Eventually, I'm going to start calling veterinarians and see if anyone has a CAT scan, you know, then and maybe isn't so such a rule follower. Um, and yeah, so but going back to I don't think they were removed. I think what happened is the outer portion of the body was annihilated. And um, it was a friend of Nathan who I was talking to that kind of clued me into to a possibility. He, he was asking me if I was familiar with bone broth which I wasn't, I'd never made bone broth. And uh, he was saying that if you take a crock pot, which is a, a pressurized cooker, 
and you put bone into it, even thick bone, uh, with, with relatively low heat and pressure within a few hours, that bone turns to sponge. And if you keep going with it, it turns to a gelatinous liquid substance, right? So with a lot of heat and pressure, bone just softens to nothing. And so if you had that heat and pressure while the bones, the long bones in the skull are being wiped out, then meanwhile, the organs inside of these chambers floating in water are going to boil like crazy and harden. And so maybe what happens, you know, is that's what's left after whatever hits them, hits them. So yeah, it, it, deformation, it deformation, easy. deformation correlates with what you see in, in uh, coroner uh, examinations of heart, which was, you know, laying in uh, in in the heat or on the sun for some certain period, right? When it start to turn around and you know, kind of curve while drying out. Oh, you mean you mean it's like starting to curl up? Is that what yeah. you mean? Everything when it's drying out, it starts to deformation, deformation. And yeah. it's you know try to squeeze it, it's squeeze and squeeze, and you you saw that on the stones when it has little spins and you know curves. Yeah. yeah, that's the most specific. Apart from the 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 blood vessel openings, the most specific find that I've found with the heart stone so far is is like some of them when you take if you think that it has a top and it has a pointed bottom, and you look at the bottom of it, some of them they literally spiral like that. And if you, you saw in the video uh, that you were playing earlier that, you know, there's this, there's this spiral contraction. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's a twist. It's, it's a twist, which is normal to a heart, which is getting dried. Right. Yeah. Oh, you asked me about the doctor as well. So that yeah. was, that was fascinating. I can't remember where I came across the video, um, but someone, who had seen my videos uh, posted a comment, said the heart is a rope. And uh, I think maybe that same person recommended the, the helical heart, heart video, which I saw. And I was just utterly blown away because this medical doctor, um, after decades of experimenting and dissecting thousands of hearts of all kinds of different species, he finally figured out a way to, um, to un untie the Gordian knot <laughs> where, where he was boiling the hearts and removing the fat. And then he was able to literally dissect the heart with his fingers, not using any knives. So he's not cutting any of the fibers. He's just separating where the fibers meet in different places. And as he does that, he unravels it. And, and it's literally one long continuous band that rolls up in this really complex way to, to create the heart. And it was, it was so fascinating when I saw it and it started, I, I, I started to realize when he rolled the heart back up that there were these points where the, the, the different fibers were meeting. And I was like, wait a minute, I've seen those lines before. Let's see if I, oh, it's kind of dark in here, but here. You know, so, It's a little bright. Uh, you can't see it. You can see it better on this side. Like this, whoop, everything's backwards. <laughs> right, that, that line right there. When you look at it at that video, you see you see when he when he folds the heart back up that that it's got these these uh, very yeah. specific lines. And so I went back to a bunch of the rocks that I'd already gathered, and they had lines in 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 those places. I was just like, oh. So he kind of he kind of proved on scientific uh, in scientific field that heart is like a a, a, a tiny not not tiny but you know just a muscle that was wrapped around and created something like a heart which we know and it's not like only the officially accepted way of uh, construction right exactly yeah the prevailing model for the heart uh is that it's this four chamber pump and they they contract in in you know synchrony and uh that for hundreds of years that was the model for for the heart that it was a pump and uh and he had a problem with that when he was going through school to become a cardiologist in here in spain he was a spanish 
doctor. And uh, he, when you start to study it, you've got bigger tubes going to smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to capillaries. So you're pushing into a greater and greater resistance because you have the viscosity of the blood, you have the friction of the blood vessel wall, and then you have the narrowing of the pipes. And he was like, this, you know, if you've ever studied plumbing, that makes no sense that the heart is a pump. And he had a, he had a problem with that and, and uh, was constantly, you know, questioning it. Yeah, there he is. And, um, and so he finally, you know, unraveled it quite literally, the, the puzzle, and, and, and discovered that it was this one continuous band. Well, that was the beginning of his discovery because the next discovery he made was even more mind blowing, which is that the, the heart, it doesn't pump at all. It actually functions as a vortex. So it's, he, it's called, the documentary there is called The Helical Heart, which I recommend to everybody. And basically what, there you can see it. Now, this is a cross section of the heart from looking above, looking down. And it's a, it's a CAT scan going through the different lines. And they're, and they're showing, you can see the, the spiral fibers as they go further down the heart. So the heart is following the same pattern that we see all throughout nature. And it's not pumping at all. I, I personally believe that the blood is being um, pulled through the through the blood vessels, and I think that the 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 red blood cells themselves are shaped like toroids. So I think that there's some kind of a you know have you ever seen the quantum locking where they where they have the su the semiconductors that are super cooled and they float them on a magnetic track, and they can even tilt them like this, and it'll go around the track keeping keeping the same tilt. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the blood is moving through the, the body in a similar fashion. And, and you have these spiraling vortexes that, that meet. And it, you know, the heart is the singularity of the, the body, really. It's uh, the, more, the more you learn about it, the more fascinating it becomes. And it has its own electromagnetic you know, field that it's, that it's emanating. It's uh, it's quite it's quite a thing. So he he discovered the shape and how it was, you know how how it was structured. But then he was able to show that the heart is actually it's functioning in this spiral fashion, which was it still hasn't been integrated into cardiology programs around the world. I mean, this should be everyday knowledge that everyone is taught, and most people know nothing about it because they have a vested interest in us, you know not understanding how things really work. <laughs> um, so that, that's Gerald Buckberg. He was, he was a famous American cardiologist who really discovered and pushed Francisco Torrent Guasp's uh, discoveries into the mainstream after 25 years of dissections. He should have won the Nobel Prize, but you know, people still, most people have never heard of him. Um, yeah, so then another, another of the, the grand synchronicities when I was doing all this studying was it turns out, I, and I saw this at the end when I, I was watching the whole documentary, and then at the end I saw his name, and, and it said Denya Spain next to his name. And I was like, Denya, Denya is the, the, it's literally like 10 minutes drive for me to, to Denya. And that's where the star fort was with the picture with the giants and, uh, you know, and then we've got Mont Go right between us here. I didn't, so, so I thought, oh man, I'd love to talk to this guy because he would recognize what I was showing in these rocks. And um, there's a foundation, but I, I found out he died 15 years ago. So no talking to him. And then, then I found out that there was a foundation. I, they had a website and one day about, uh, mostly awards for acting, that's true. Something is warm. Uh, so um, so about a month, I don't know, maybe two months ago, I got the courage to, to call the foundation and uh, see if there was anyone there that I could speak to that might be able to, you know, put me in touch with a cardiologist who knew about Guasp's work, was open-minded enough to consider that sometimes mavericks do have ideas that everyone else rejects, and sometimes they reject those ideas for decades. And uh, I wanted to, you know, see if a cardiologist could recognize what what I had to show. Um, 
So I called and, and Francisco Torrent Guasp's wife answered, which I kind of half expected, but I really wasn't expecting it. So I spoke to her for a little while in Spanish, best I could. And um, she was really nice. And uh, she, when I told her what, what I was hoping to do, she put me in touch with her son who was junior, now not junior, because his father's no longer alive, but uh, also named Paco Guasp, uh, Paco for short. And uh, yeah, so I, I called him up that day and uh, spoke to him on the phone. And he, he uh, I, I didn't tell him exactly what I wanted to talk to him about because I was afraid he'd think I was crazy. And um, so I just told him just enough to pique his curiosity. And he, um, he was like, well, I'm coming to, Javier, this afternoon I could I could swing by and I was like, sure. <laughs> so all of a sudden I was like, I had three hours to prepare for this guy coming and go through all my rocks and organize them and lay them out in a way that was coherent. And, uh, and, and by that, the way, being a little crazy is okay when you st when, when you do something outstanding, right? Yeah, in, in Italian they have a they have an expression. They say uh, genio e sregolatezza. And that when you put an S in front of something, it means the opposite. And it, and it means genius is, it, you would translate it directly to without ruleness. It's not, not without rules, but without ruleness. <laughs> Genuous regulatezza. I always love that one. Um, yeah. So he came by and uh, I filmed before he came uh, just talking about my thoughts and, um, and then showing what I was going to be showing him to, to, to the people watching. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to ask him to film or, or to record him when, it, when he was here. Cause I thought it would make him nervous and put him on guard. So I, I did. So you, you, you told him you have a YouTube channel, right? He, he knew you would be. I, told him I, have a YouTube channel. I gave him, a, I sent him a link. Um, you know, I told him that I'd made a video about his dad. I made a video called Helico hearts petrified, um, uh, petrified organs and synchronicities. And I talk a lot about his life and I talk about the things that he did and his discoveries and why they're important. And, you know, and then I show how it relates to what I was finding in the rocks. And it's, um, I, 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 I recommend that video if people are curious about this subject at all. Um, and I told him about what's that. His, what was his reaction actually after you, you showed him all those rocks? Well, he was here for almost 90 minutes. So at first I thought he's going to think I'm crazy and he's going to want to go. And I decided beforehand that I wasn't going to mention the mountain at all because the rocks is already a big enough leap to try and get your head around and to, to consider as a possibility. Um, if I told him that the mountain that he grew up next to used to be a, an elephant, he, he probably would have left a lot sooner than 90 minutes. So I don't know if he'll ever come across that information or not, but he, he was initially, he was open. He was kind of curious about it and he was listening to what I had to say. I took him to, you know, showed him the best rocks first because <laughs> I didn't want him to like immediately reject it. I wanted to show him, look, there's a lot here, especially when you see them all lined up next to each other. The number of, my, my friend Victor has talked about, because I don't have any XRF, you know, or CAT scans or anything that the skeptics would consider to be you know, real scientific evidence. I've followed the scientific method to the best of my ability. Um, and I ha I'm observing empirical evidence, but there's no, there are no variables to manipulate. You know, it's not like I have a test that I can perform to prove it. There are different machines and different things where I could look at the, the atomic structure and what, what the constituent elements are and what the breakdowns are by percentage. And if that corresponded to the elements that are in a heart, then that would be game over, in my opinion. Um, but uh, the, the problem is that there may be transmutation of elements occurring as well. Um, I mean, I've been looking into that a lot lately, the idea of biological transmutation, where plants and beings can actually take atoms and turn them into other atoms. And we're taught that's not possible in the, in the mainstream model. We're, we're taught that that requires suns and massive gravitation to, to uh, you know, create the kind of heat and pressure necessary to create new elements to, that give rise to the periodic table. And that's also not true. 
Um, ancient what are you know? Yeah. What are yeah, your thoughts on ancient that? Before, yeah, geopolymer. I think a lot of them are geopolymers and were molded. Uh, I don't think a lot of this stuff was carved. Um, I mean, uh, the economy is is the most ex explainable thing in construction, right? So you have a limited amount of resources each time you start any construction. But if you have a natural source of this, you know, geopolymer concrete type of uh, flow, uh, which could, can come from underground, which we know is uh, very easily proceeded while you do drilling, or you can use it from a mud volcano source, which are, you know, officially recognized to be, uh, you know, uh, officially recognized mud volcanoes sources, which are everywhere. For example, where I live in Russia, you, you probably have mud volcanoes in Spain and uh, you name it. So, so many countries have mud volcanoes, just Google it. Probably your area guys also have some or the so-called uh, hot water sources, springs and so on. So this is all related to something hot and preheated mud type of uh, solution that might, might come from underground. And when it solidifies, when it gets heated by the sun or when it dries out, literally, it becomes something like a cement, biological cement type of organic cement type of structure and it solidifies to rocks and even can be uh, looking like granite. Granite, yeah. Well, I think they can, they can produce any. In the, in the observation deck videos that I mentioned before, he talks about something called desquamation. Squamous, if people might have heard of that, like our skin cells, when you look at the different layers in the skin, the top layer, are called, they're flat and it's called squamous cells. Um, and this is a term that's used even to this day in, with companies that you know, manufacture different kinds of stone, creating geopolymers. And basically what happens with a geopolymer that doesn't happen with naturally occurring rock is that there's an outer layer that starts to flake off, just like we get dead skin cells that kind of fall away. And apparently when it's, when it's like nature made it, <laughs> it doesn't do that. But when, when you look at a lot of these buildings, they show the telltale signs of desquamation. Yeah, there is a bunch of uh, mud uh, floods and mud flows everywhere. So this is not just, you know, an ordinary same thing, which is, you know, extraordinary thing. Everywhere you go, you can find mudslides and those rocks and uh, so-called rocks, but literally it's just the stockpiles of mud. Yeah, when, when you were talking with Mike Ferreira, you know, he was talking about... Um, I mean, he's putting everything within the context of mining, and and I think that a lot of what he what he says has merit and is and is interesting. Um, you know, when some of the things where he's looking at laser ablation and comparing that to you know what different volcanic structures look like, very very interesting. But when when it comes to things like limestone, which is what this mountain is made of, and when when you look at bone. That's an interesting thing about trabecular bone and the structure of bone. When you look at limestone, according to mainstream geology, limestone is made of bone. <laughs> That's the official, like if you pull, you know, you pull out. That, that creature skeletons, right? That creature skeletons. Yes. Coral, skeleton, mollusk, shellfish, compressed for many, many years. Um, I'd like to, there's, there's something I want to talk about that has to do with, you know, uh, letting go of sacred cows, you know, that, that um, ties into this. If I can share my screen, I don't, how do I do that? Is it possible? With this? Yes, if you do, you watch below, you see share button, then you press share the whole screen, and then you press on that, whatever image is looking like a screen on that, in that window. Gotcha. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to share share screen. Two monitors. Yes. Is it going to share everything? No. Good. Okay. Let's 
Move that one down. Can you see my screen now? No. No. Hold on one second. Let me look at it again. Oh, I didn't do the final. There we go. Okay. All right. So I just want to show you. If we look at limestone, where'd it go? I have a folder. You show us the green people. The green people, yeah. That's another that's a story for another time. Um sorry, one second there. There we go. Next. Yellowstone. The paint pots must be mud volcanoes. <laughs> okay. So you can see that, right? Yep. So here we have we have limestone that um, you can you can see the shells in it, and those can be very very small. And here you can see the coral and the and the the different shells compacted. So I think that there are limestone sedimentary layers that are made out of all of these these creatures, but not all limestone is like that. And somebody who was very critical of my channel, he's, he, he had studied geology. He's like, what you're saying is completely impossible because, uh, you know, I've been in Spain and I've, I've climbed those mountains and I've seen with my own eyes that, that the limestone, you know, looks like, looks like this. And if you just pull out a microscope, then you'll debunk, you know, yourself right away. Um, so he didn't want to give my theory the time of day because he was assuming that Mont Go and all the limestone that I was reporting on around Mont Go looked like this. And I had been walking here for ages and I was like, it doesn't, it doesn't look like that at all. Um, what, what you find more is, let's see, this is, this is what trabecular bone looks like under a microscope. It's fractal. You get these Swiss cheese holes and then it gets thinner and thinner the, the, the deeper into it you go. And um, let me just switch to another folder here. There we go. So this is the limestone that that you see around Mont Go. And you can see here we've got the, the larger. This, is, this, is, this one is way different from what you've been shown before. This is way different. Yeah. Here's here's one here. Yeah, so this is see, look like a you know some you know maybe spine bones, something yeah, like this. This this is this is bone, even even according to geology, but not as not as I intend intend it. Um, but you've got little micro blood vesseling, you've got holes going in. The holes are inevitably filled with a dark red earth, or they're filled with iron ore, or you've got quartz crystal, which is um, I don't. I don't have an example. Here's a this is a big one. <laughs> how Tell much how iron? How much iron is in the blood? How much iron? Um, I don't know what the percentages are, but um, can it be plausible evidence for, for, for these blood marks? See how see how this is going this way into the darkness, but then there's a one here going down that way. To me, this debunks the whole idea of erosion by some kind of water flow that, that looks, yeah yeah that, this selectiveness of this you know tunnels the selectiveness of the tunnels isn't isn't uh, you right. know and that's uh, how that's how blood incident. Goes. here you see my foot um you know so you can see that's a pretty big chunk w water doesn't no. select which way to flow it just flows right so it doesn't create the special micro chambers in certain you know, places where it's coincidental looking like, you know, something yeah. else. And and when it's broken up, like here, this chunk is missing. And when you look at it, you know, you can see that these lines go through it also. And um, and then what, what are the actual like, oh, odds? What are the actual odds of this to be created this way? <laughs> yeah, I'm constantly asking that question. What are the odds? Um, and and oh, I started to say before my friend Victor. He says that what I've what I've started on are this is this is what's known as proof based on logical consistency. So I don't have some kind of an experiment that I can perform. 
Uh, and I haven't done testing with some machines that people would accept as, as you know, the word of God. But I have compiled a tremendous number with both the mountain and the heart stones of, of anatomical correlations that I think go way beyond chance. Um, and uh, there's a part six to come on the, on the Titan uh, series as well. So here is bedrock and here is an outer layer. And when you break that away, it's got red mud underneath it. And then there's, there's vascularity as well. This, this'll, this'll give you an idea. It, it's like, oh, you, you would think this was just deposited, you know, by a mud flood or something. But when you start to break it, if, if I took this rock here and I broke it open, then it would reveal chambers with mud inside the rock, which doesn't make sense. And another thing that's really interesting, and this is something that, I, that I've been thinking about for a long time, and it's going into the next video as well. Here you see what I call transition bone, which is like, it, you've got cortical bone, which is the thicker bone. It's easier if I have a visual here for it. Um, let's see if I got one. Uh, da, da, da. Here, wait, Stone. hold on one second. So all of those rocks above, while I'm looking for this thing, they, they're they broken pieces, not of the kind of rock below, not this rock, but that other rock that I was showing you that had all the lines and the blood vessels. It's like a thinner layer that can be broken up into these fragmented chunks. And what you'll never see are, are any of these rocks becoming heart stones. And, and what's interesting about these terraces is they literally cover the entire, re this entire region of Spain, all the way up to like mind boggling heights are terraces everywhere you see. I'll show you some, actually, wait a minute. Let me just show you here. This is better. All right. So here's our favorite mountain. And when you, when you start to look at, at the lines, can you see that? Yeah. So there are all these lines here and some, some are saying, oh, that's, that's um, sedimentary layering. That disproves your theory. Well, all of, all over this region of Spain, it doesn't matter where you go, you find those lines. See all those? Those are not, those are not, those are man-made or man, probably man-made. That, those are just like that picture I showed. Those are these. And uh, they are in quantities that, that uh, defy belief here. Hold on, let me just show you. So it's artificial, right? Yeah, and they're everywhere. And they're made of the, the outer layer. And then like this would be bedrock. This is, this is the thicker, what I call cortical bone. Um, and then you find these, let's see here. I think this is the one. So this is, um, this is a really big older terrace and you can see like, so it's like, a, so it's like a slurry walls for, for this, uh, you know, he will not to collapse and maybe used for, uh, transportation. Oh, you know. Yeah. They're used for, they're used for lots of things. They're used for ag agriculture. It's a very dry region. So they use them to catch water. Um, and they're also using them for growing almonds and olive and fruit trees. And, and this entire region, you cannot even imagine the scope of, of how many of these terraces there are. But the thing, the thing is when you look at it and you realize that these are all broken pieces of, let me find that, like I should. By the way, it's funny, but the same technology is used when, when they create the railways because the railway is supposed to be uh, on top of, 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 of the landscape so the water will flow off. Mm -hmm. And they also cover it with these rocks formations like you just showed. Yeah, so if I were to break this into pieces, the pieces would be very jagged. You could use it to build a wall. But you, like a, a terrace like that, but you wouldn't use it to build a building because it's so riddled with holes. It's not, you know. Yeah, you have to have cement to 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 compose all this stuff, right? And yeah, those walls are without any cement. They just, you know, 
com compelled together and that's it. Yeah, no, they're just, they've just placed them. They've just stacked them. And uh, yeah. that's why I stacked, wanted to show you, you um, like here, here's an example of how wide they can be sometimes. Look at, look at that. That's just filled. And that's literally out in the middle of nowhere. That was on a trail the other day that we, that we discovered. So if you imagine all of that rock and, and, Imagine that those terraces are everywhere in every direction on every hill and you imagine all of that rock before it was broken into pieces How would it have looked and my theory is that all over? Uh, this region it looked like This but it was all smooth and unbroken and I think that uh, all of Mont Go and all of these other mountains they had a completely different look before those terraces were made and then with the terraces comes all the vegetation. So you see regions and it looks like, oh, there's just a lot of trees there. There's no terraces or anything. There was a whole region nearby here that burned uh, a couple of years ago. Right down here, this whole region burned. And when it once it burned, then it exposed. You can see these terraces go all this. This area has been lived in for a very, 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 very long time. Every single mountain covered with those everywhere. So if you imagine all of that was this smooth kind of rock that's filled with blood vessels, might look a lot more like an elephant then. Don't know what that is, if that's a sculpture or what, but, you know, imagine that the size of a mountain. Um, this is the, the Gata de Gorgos river here goes up through, through this valley and all through this region, all over, all the way down to the seas, you find these heart stones. But as soon as you go up into the hills, even a little bit, um, it's a completely different kind of rock. It totally changes. It no longer looks that way. Um, so then the question is, is it geology or biology? Is that a tree? Mike Ferrer thinks it's mining, right? That would be mining, I guess. I think the trees were real. There's all kinds of weird places <laughs> in this world, but uh, yeah, so we, 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 we call it recycling and nowadays, right? Recycling. So something that was probably biological could turn to be, you know, something petrified. Then it comes to mining. Somebody makes mining of it with, with the help of technologies, including those that Mike Ferrer is talking about. So this I is done, that doesn't I contradict any of it. Is, is just the question of what were they mining? Right, they were gold, it just, copper, iron, everything. No, I, I mean, as far as the terrain that they were mining, I think that I think that they were what he calls the ancient miners. I think they were mining the titans. I think that was their primary source. If biology can transmute elements, then we've got everything in us in one form or another. I mean, um, we we um, both you and Mike uh, sometimes look. Uh, in different directions, but actually you're talking about the same thing. Uh, so it's just, you know, it's we're talking about different methods of mining, right? So there's block cave mining, there's drilling, there is uh, quarrying, right? Also different with, and it looks different after it's done, after it's abandoned. And there's uh, hydro, uh, you know, hydro, um, uh, hydraulic mining, right? And right. he's also talking about this electric method that could be used to discharge certain electric uh, frequencies into the ground. And if that is a mud, this mud can create maybe certain things that look like uh, rivers and uh, they look like road systems. They can look like whatever. Just for them to start mining one of that parts of that you know discharge and so they discharge it all over again until they done in a certain you know 
way and certain efficiency and that is sponsored by the economics of mining that is kind of you know it's all the way to the goal the goal is to sell the resources that you mine to somebody else and get the budgets to mine more and that could be explainable in in the way of logistics it could be explainable in in the way of those star farts that we find everywhere and so even your place has a star fort so who knows maybe those star forts were outposts of the miners and this is what we see we see the evidence of their work they could have been charging uh this place with explosives and collapsed the whole this left side of this mongo mountain and then use it to create the people use the rocks to create these races for the agriculture and could have been inhabiting the area after all this done mining all this mining operation is done right somebody's supposed to be feeding those people when they leave those miners mm -hmm. with their equipment because nobody well, would leave a lot of terraces here growing a lot of food to feed a whole lot more people than so they now. created they created the uh, the logistics they created the uh, the construction the, the primary construction of starfort and they created the resources for the further development of the region right the roads mm -hmm. uh the the rocks for for construction of those terraces maybe the rocks for construction or maybe even the blocks for construction the houses who knows maybe a port maybe uh, you know a road to some capital city of miners all, all of the above that's my new answer to just about everything i think you know it's it's like the the classic you know one with the professors the blind professors palpating the elephant and everyone's got each one's got hold of something different and thinks it's something different you know nobody nobody can see the big picture and so a lot of people get they, they get their pet theory and they think everything is that theory. And, and uh, I've seen that happen a number of times. You know, the melted buildings is, is a good example. Like it's an interesting idea because there's a lot of evidence for it, but if you try and apply it to everything, it doesn't work. And, uh, and then, so people get, you know, you have to be willing to give thing, give up ideas as you're moving along. Like when you, you mentioned my channel and in, in a video you did a couple of times ago, and you were you were talking about how you appreciated that I get on the ground and I'm in there and I'm looking at actual stuff and I'm not just an armchair researcher and uh, you know college so that, college expert yeah it's it's um, it's important to to interact with with what you're looking at and uh, not just see it on a screen and sometimes you come across information that contradicts your you know what your your view on things and. I thought that almost happened when I was looking at the, let me, I'm going to share my screen again to show you. Um, someone was talking about the, um, the, the mountain said, oh, well, there's, there's, um, you've got the, uh, you've got sedimentary layers on the mountain. So that, you know, game over there, there's your, there's your theory out the window that, that you've got these, these layers, right? It's just, piled on layer after layer. And I was like, yeah, gosh, you know that, I'm not sure how to explain that, but I've found all of these things in the eye and there's all this stuff with the ear. There's the macro anatomy of the, you know, the, there's a big crevice between the legs, a deep canyon that, that, that you can hike up. Um, there, there are all these very specific things. And I was like, well, what's, what's up with this? Why? And then it, then it occurred to me one day that, um, that, bone grows like this right and i and i was like well wait a minute what and I, I started looking into it even more and then i came across this and this is looking from above at cranial bones <laughs> guess how they grow yeah, in, in, in a certain <laughs> dimension you see them parallel to each other so they're yes. looking the same yeah yeah they're growing like rings of a tree but it's not a flat this isn't flat even though it looks flat on a, on two dimensions this is curving downward, but from the side, you get these these straight lines. Does that make sense? So and they, oh, they, 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 you know, follow this pattern all the way to to the inside, right? Right. And so that happened with this guy who was criticizing me about the the microscope stuff, or I mean, about the the limestone as well, right? He said this debunks you. And so I was looking at all these with you know 
with the naked eye and I was going that that's not my experience of these these limestone rocks at all here I've never seen a single trace of any shell or any any even a tiny little fish skeleton or anything in any of that limestone so what he's saying doesn't make any sense so so I, I decided okay well I went I went out and I got myself a microscope and uh, it was a 60x microscope and I went out to these rocks right here because I wanted to look at them up close and these are the these are the 60x pictures that I that I took um, and there is no hint anywhere at 60x of of any of these um, you know these sea creatures sea creatures and organisms not a single hint of them so I was like okay well it doesn't make sense like here you can see this is broken off and I, I picked up this or no that that's just part of this one broken off and even in here there's no sign of any sea creatures anywhere so you know how is that possible that it could be compressed and form this kind of rock with all these channels and everything but there's not going to be a hint of any any sea creatures at all so i i got myself uh, a better microscope and this one was um, this one goes between 500 and 1000 x and uh, i went back out and i looked at this is what a hair looks like at 500 x and this is a tiny 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 little flower this is the wing of a gnat okay <laughs> So I, so this is this is a limestone at, at five. It's it's either five hundred or a thousand x, and that's actual growth there. The yellow is um, is a mossy sort of thing. Those those little round yellow things, you'll see those in a second up close what they look like. But this is, you know, when you look at the what looks like rusty iron, there's no hint whatsoever of any of those kind of creatures. And uh, yeah, so I, uh, this is what that moss looks like up, up close. That's a thousand X. Um, that's the only life sign of life I could find. Uh, no other signs of life besides that. And you can see here that it's really a microscopic version of the, of the trabecular bone that I've, that I've shown you. You know, it's a, it's a tiny, tiny version of that. So, I think it's important to when when people criticize things to to actually listen to what they're saying and, and see if their argument has merit and then, um, you know, and actually investigate things before you criticize them. Um, and so, you know, there I, I, it's called killing sacred cows, you know, it, like in the in the truth movement, when I was looking at earth shape and everything, I came across uh, crepuscular rays. And I thought, oh, this is undeniable proof that uh, that the sun is smaller and it's closer. Otherwise, they wouldn't they wouldn't um, veer off like that. Um, and then I saw a video of a guy showing that that's just the nature of how light works. And if you're driving past a field, and you ever see the guy running in the field, you know that's like the lines the lines are perfectly parallel. But that's when that's when you're looking straight out but the lines out to the sides are angling away. So when I realized that, I was like, wait a minute, that's just the function of how our eyes work. So, you know, there's still tons of people that are, it, crepuscular rays doesn't prove earth shape either way. You know, it's, it's inconclusive, <laughs> but, to, but there's tons of people claiming that, that the sun is, is smaller and it's closer because of crepuscular rays. Now that may be true, but it may not be true. It's not conclusive proof because you can, you can see that it's it not. can it can be you know it can be repeatable but it cannot be you know actually on topic because of something could be blocking the same light and could be reflecting like a studio light is also just imagine if the studio light is something that is reflecting the the actual sunlight from above and that doesn't work actually this way mm -hmm. so the the, the light itself is uh, the way to research because if you research uh, how the light uh, works how the light bulbs are working how how this light is you know pixels of those lights how many can be transferred in a distance 
you, there's no way you can prove that something can reflect off some planet in the solar system this way so you can see the light of the sun from that distance reflecting from that object and going back to earth this is you know ridiculous because mm -hmm. uh the size of the sun on earth is you know well known to the distance of whatever it's like 100 million kilometers or 100 miles 93, uh, yeah 93 million miles i don't know how 93 that. million miles and uh, when you uh, check the distance f for example to the i don't know pluto <laughs> and that distance is way you know way more longer then we have to to the earth and there is no way the light would reflect to that distance and go back to the earth as is just unimaginable you know yeah there's so i mean that's such a big and deep topic obviously um what do you think about the giant tree thing Oof. i'm not pointing at each and every table mountain to be a you know ancient tree stump petrified mm -hmm. tree stump because none of that basalt thing is working with with my opinion i'm researching melted rocks right now and i'm gonna make a brief video very soon about melted rocks how they can be used in in current technology uh, there's a there's a lot of information about that actually and uh, all those rocks look like type of basalt and uh, so um, that kind of proves that basalt is actually preheated, melted rock that is coming from underneath. So as I was saying, that could be due to reaction, some chemical reaction that can be created artificially while drilling to, to the bottom of some certain layer and in injecting some chemical there. So the reaction might, might start and the melting procedures will you know be uh, started and ignited and then you you get you can probably reach to the certain hit point when all the stuff can erupt like a volcano and who knows because this lava also looks like a melted rock it looks like a little bit polished when it dries out so kind of like basalt so um, the production of pipes pipelines and uh, grinders like they are also used in mining, uh, even payments on the streets and the roads could be used from this melted rock, and they actually do it and sell this rock uh, in some certain areas. Czech has it, Russia has this production of melted rock formations and pipelines. So this is very interesting. I'll make a video about that. So uh, you you all guys see that all these melted rocks looks different from what people call melted buildings because when it's melted it's melted and when it's just you know a flow that is drying out and looking like melted it's not melted because melted is always polished and shiny okay mm. yeah vitrification so, i think vitrification yeah. yeah you know i think we have a pretty good show today and uh, as you wished it was two hours thanks a lot everybody in the chat we see a bunch of uh, people interacting and uh, you can subscribe to Mike's channel, uh, click in the link in the description. There's also a video that uh, is also uh, probably a coincidental evidence that Mike is doing great research because uh, those haters created a video about him. <laughs> and you can click the link and go to that video and dislike the, that yeah. video for, for us because it has only 100 dislikes. So we might as well give him another 100 although it won't help because that channel is really big that's Simon yeah. Dan and yeah. so that that um, video that he did uh got 170,000 views it's awful video that. because I he, had a two week wave of hatred that came towards me it's awful it video because I watched it a bunch of times and I couldn't so find bad. any couldn't logic in know. his you know he's trying to to be you know scientific calling himself it's Simon Dan he contradicts and, scientific method in a variety of ways and yeah. he's just the, like a propaganda uh, you know from soviet union uh, putting a little clip of your uh you know research and then saying no 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 that doesn't exist and put yeah, another clip of yours no 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 this is obviously doesn't exist mud mud floods never happen i said what 
you just you know check out the history of, of, of for example wales where you have this mining waste pile mud uh, that you know got the school buried in 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 a second and a bunch of kids died there and all those you know well welish people were trying to you know dig with their own bare hands to save their kids and many different flash flies everywhere in mud flood in in indonesia which is currently ongoing never stopped for for 12 years mm. i don't know how. so there's a bunch of mud floods and going and mud is flowing from underneath so i, I don't know what these people are trying to prove and what are they why if they're interested in your research that is a, a huge grade for you to be a real researcher and being bugging them <laughs> Yeah, a friend of mine, Howard, was like, you should be thrilled, man. You attracted the, one of the biggest trolls out there. <laughs> it's like, that's like total confirmation. You're on the right track. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't fun. A, a friend of mine, David, uh, told me, hey, you can set the videos to uh, approve only on the comments. And that was a lifesaver because I was like having to monitor the channel because I don't mind if people come in with criticism. And if they've got, if they see flaws in the work that I've done and, and the, the research and they're like, but what about this or what about that? I take the time, I answer those questions, but but uh, you know, it was uh, that wasn't what was happening. These guys were just coming and telling me I shouldn't procreate, and you know, that is like initiation, man. Gene pool and et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a college initiation, man. When you have like a, a rookie year and you have this initiation, trial somebody some, somebody trolls you with some heavy. A serious uh, drink uh, you think it's a iced tea uh, you drink it and you totally knock you out so <laughs> I mean you're a great person you have a uh, real uh, life experience with you know fighting um, somebody which is right now uh, in, in, in most of the headlines in the previous year uh, and so you had an experience that that is quite I, I ran across another channel the other day that did like a three or four minute mocking video and it's like it wasn't neil degrasse that video like it's like i you know i would say something and then he pauses the video and he adds laughter like a laugh track to it i was like okay now i'm a sitcom you know <laughs> it's, it's, it's just it's kind of surreal but I, I wanted to ask you a question before we go um are you familiar with hangman 1128's channel not really. I, I, let me just make sure I got the right number. Um, YouTube. Because um, he's done probably like 50 hours of on site research um, where he's showing, uh, yeah, Hangman 1128, I think. Yes, that's the right number. Yeah, he, he's. Um, He's done some great uh, footage where he is showing basically every kind of, if you imagine a tree decomposing and breaking into different pieces and all the different kinds of patterns that would form from a decomposing tree. And he shows like time and time again, like he, he's in the forest and he goes and he picks up a piece of tree and then he like holds it up and, and right behind it is a mountain that looks identical to the tree. So basically, if you think of the trees that are there now as moss and, you know, the great avatar trees were there in the past, he's got very, very compelling footage and evidence for that. Um, I, I mean, Roger thinks Devil's Tower was a tendon ball. No, I don't think so. I think, I think that was a tree or, or some organic thing. I, I don't think it was... It was, or not a tendon ball, he, he, the tendon inserting into a heel or something. I, um, I, I think that some of the plateaus may be the remains of mining. Some may be uh, former trees that were, you know, and then you see these jagged mountains. Uh, so yeah, check out the tree thing. I think it's, I think it's fascinating. Yeah, it looks like our world was used by different, you know, layers oh. of creatures and one, no, one more important thing. Can you can you do another five or ten five minutes more? This is this is uh, something you're going to want to see because talk about um, killing sacred cows. I'm just going to share the screen again. 
So uh, a friend of mine, Eugenie, has uh, come across uh, an archive of, um, of, let's see, where is it? Talk, here we go. He's, he's producing a video on this um, now, but he, I'm just gonna give a teaser. So I've said in a number of videos, and I need to eat some crow here because I, I lived in Rome for a couple of years. I spent a lot of time walking around these great, you know, what we call Tartarian buildings in this community of this great old architecture. And I know I, what- I call, I call them antique. <laughs> antique, right? Well, when I came across the World's Fair stuff, to me, that was a smoking gun for a completely rewritten history. And I, I looked at the scale of those buildings and I said, it's absolutely impossible that they were made out of wood. You, a, a structure that big couldn't support itself with just wood. And if they were to spend the time to make those structures out of wood, um, you know, it, it, why on earth would they burn them down? The amount of wood and the size of the beams and everything required, it was just off, off the charts. But he's come across an archive with thousands of photos. This is all from St. Louis, all stages of construction. Some of it is steel beam, but a lot of it is wood. And you can see the wooden planks like here, you can see them lying there. So this is gonna kind of send shockwaves, I think, through through the alternative researching community because we, what we've seen up to this point, or at least what I've seen, has been loads of buildings with lots of, you know, if you see any scaffolding, there's a bit of ladders laying here and there. A lot of it looks like staged photos, but you know, the stuff when you look at St. Louis and, and Chicago, I, I thought there's no way in hell that's made out of wood and whitewash. But he, you know, the, look at this. This is, you've seen this building before, right? This is actual under construction photos. And uh, so Eugenie is putting out a video, uh, I think in the next couple of days, he just started a channel called Retrospect, uh, I don't want to mispronounce it, Retrospectology, like looking at things in retrospect. Uh, retrospectology, it's a new channel. I think he'd be thrilled to have some subs. He's super enthusiastic, great guy. He's you taking- can come, You can come back to the comment section after this video is done and just- Yeah, you know. he's, um, he's, uh, he's got a very syncretic approach. I'm trying to get back to it. Where are you? Uh, there we go. He's got a very syncretic approach to all of this. He's he's interested in looking at the overlaps, not just ruling things out, you know, um, because they, they don't no. fit with something you believe. And uh, I think it's going to be a great channel. And um, yeah. it what is I actually did, what I actually didn't like in, in all this stuff is uh, that people started to call everything Tartarian and uh, right. uh, making up that everything was from the red brick because uh, what was from red brick it still hangs on because all those buildings that created in this white white antique you know uh column colonial whatever style uh classical style they don't exist anymore and we cannot prove they made from red bricks right and if they were made from red bricks actually why wouldn't they be still hanging on like the rest of the buildings so uh they might as well be wood buildings who actually knows i never made a video about those uh destroyed expositions but uh, it looks like after chicago fire for example uh, they could have been destroyed by the fires and all these events that they had in chicago because most of the buildings were destroyed and they also connect this to the raising of the streets after the fire was done they needed to you know start to make creating those sewers and stuff like this and so they started raising the buildings that were left and right. uh, but that doesn't make sense in in case of um, uh, the previous city. So the previous city was created so badly that they had all those sewers all also not working at all. So this is also uh, doesn't make sense because the city was growing, so the people were healthy. So probably if they were healthy, they had good sewer system, right? Good water and didn't have any shit around uh, you know their houses like they say about this horse crap theory as the people were creating pavements and all those pavements raise and raise and raise and raise and they're supposed to move to the second floor this is 
you know, ridiculous. These buildings like, have bathrooms and kitchens. I wonder if they even ate. Maybe maybe they didn't need to eat back then. Yeah, there's a question of bathrooms also that mm -hmm. comes up uh, to to discussion because people start to say if they had bathrooms actually, where did they they you know <laughs> why don't they have them in in those huge palaces like you know in in France? Well, if they were giants, there was probably greater air, air pressure oxygen con concentration because that causes gigantism in biology biology is you increase the pressure they've done it with tomatoes and like it grows thousands of tomatoes and they're and they're big so maybe they were just absorbing prana i don't know um bushwhacking tartaria is a great channel they get on the ground and and check stuff out i think you've interviewed him uh, also, there's a, a, another guy that, that's really great, Paul Cook. I think I saw him in the chat earlier. Shout out to Paul. He's doing really great stuff. You talked in that video where you mentioned my channel. You were, you were basically, without using the word, you were arguing for a syncretic approach to all of this, where we're trying to see where things mix and overlap. And I, and I really respect that. And I, I think you hold a, a very high standard when it comes to what you expect from researchers. And I appreciate that. Um, and uh, John Levy, the same week that you came out with that video, uh, basically was saying the exact same thing. So I, I think uh, this is in order, if there's going to be any kind of unification, any kind of power as a grassroots community, we have to stop like cutting each other off at the knees and, uh, you know, start to cooperate more. Yeah, why not? Why not? Why not? Because everything is advancing and so... We, I, I'm just, you know, really tired of new topics. So I'm just trying to uh, make what people ask. People ask me to make a video about 1971. So I'm making this video. This is what my, you know, schedule looks like. I, I go back to my group and see what people ask me to, to do first. So. Yeah, I, I had to take some time off. I, I was just, yeah, it's been a weird year with COVID and restrictions and yeah, we had, we we all had a terrible year, and so this is all gonna continue and gonna be intensifying very you know in front of our eyes. Nobody would have think of uh, what would happen f f three years ago, two years ago. Everybody was you know not even using the reset term, and now everybody using the reset term, <laughs> and that is you know ridiculous because you know people come back uh, to what I was saying like three years, four years ago, and just, you know, make new videos about the same topics. And you, you, those videos pop up everywhere. I go in Facebook, people just making the same topic videos. And that is just, you it's know, a, it's, a it's, 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 it's a path of research. You, you, if, you, if you start researching alternative history, you, you, you get stuck in all those topics that I got stuck four years ago. This is mm -hmm. obviously the path. Yeah, somebody's mentioning FENDAP. That's uh, Flat Earth Nation. They uh, something Pretori. I can't remember. There it is. Yeah, not yeah, we, he, I, I, I've been showing. I've been showing FENDAP. his channel. Yeah, he's he. Uh, you know, he's been saying some iffy things about me, but also paid me a lot. They, they the guys, so they didn't steal. And, and we have. I don't know, at some point we'll probably have a conversation. They didn't steal the, the term Great Reset. They just used the reset as a technology for all these, you know, things and these circles and this cyclic history that we have. It's just, you know, pre, 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 prior prescribed to us and planned way back in the days. Every Everything is predictive programming when you get into it. It's just like... And those who don't learn what from is Mudflood? Mudflood mud right? mud is one of the reset, reset technologies that is obviously evident and you can find it mostly in every city that has 19th century buildings. Then after 19th century, those buildings with, this, with the similar evidence start to disappear mystically and the cultural layer stops growing and this is the period that we you know synchronize in our research which is like uh, from 1820s to 1840s maybe 50s which possibly the period of the previous 19th century 
event which could not be simultaneous in every area so spit in in the face of those people who say it was simultaneous who th think it was a tsunami type of event this is not a tsunami type of event nothing has any evidence of that. cultural layer is when the horses shit 15 meters high and then they just put pavement over it yeah, and then and they only shit with clay <laughs> remember that so oh, yeah. when the horses yeah. shit with clay it's yeah. called the mud flood anomaly old, old time horses yeah those horses that carried all those materials and construction blocks for those magnificent buildings that we can observe okay thanks a lot for watching guys i hope it wasn't boring this time see you guys later thanks mike uh -huh. <laughs>